Hello. So, <clears throat> what is ray tracing? Ray tracing is sort of seen as the holy grail, if you will, the philosopher's stone, the lifelong quest of uh, computer graphics, at least doing it in real time. And the reason for that is we can get an incredible amount of detail out of scenes. The classic example of a ray tracer is we have a camera is viewing a scene and the purpose of the camera is to sort of fill in an image on a screen. The camera has a forwards vector, a right and an up vector and by adding combinations of the up and right vector to the forwards vector the camera can shoot through various pixels on the screen. Anyway, let's say we have a scene here. So we have some sort of sphere here and then another sphere behind it. We trace this ray out through the screen and we want to intersect the ray with the sphere. So the idea is we have a sphere, we have a start position for the ray. The ray has a direction. So anywhere along there, the uh, position will be the start position plus some parameter t times the direction. And we want to find for which value of t does this intersect with the plane. It might not hit at all, it might miss. Anyway, so the ray goes out. Just for this, this, this will look a little weird, but just for this example, I'm trying to demonstrate it. Um, and it hits sphere, but it might continue and hit another sphere. That's why I said it'll look weird. Um, so what we do is we then determine based on the value of t. So if the value of the parameter t is positive, then the ray is shooting out from the camera. If it's negative, then it's sort of hit something behind the camera. That's possible as well. Could be hitting something behind the camera. We ignore those. And then we pick the largest sorry, the smallest positive value of t, that's the closest position. So here we might have t equals 1, here we might have t equals 2, because the ray goes further and hits the sphere. We ignore that t equals 2. When we hit that, we also have the option of, let's say we have a light. Okay, so we compute, we trace out towards the light, and we see if we hit anything in between, basically. And yeah, that's the basic idea of ray tracing in a nutshell. Okay, there are other methods. Um, there's another method called path tracing. And the way path tracing works is if we have... If we have a scene and we trace, we hit something, we keep reflecting until we hit a light source. So we trace the whole path. So let's say this goes through a whole number of rebounds. It only stops when it hits a light source. Now the benefit of this is that we get global illumination. What that means is that this object, if this thing is green, there will be some green reflection on this one. So this one will be sort of blue and green. And then here, we'll have reflections from this wall and this wall tinted by the light. Now, obviously, this has some drawbacks. It's more computationally expensive. And ray tracing is computationally expensive enough as it is. There's another method called ray marching and when the ray the way ray marching works is let's say we have an object and we have a ray that's going to trace and hit that object well what we do is we don't sort of solve a mathematical equation we simulate it by a loop so we have a fixed increment and we step forward until we hit something and we might you know because this is a fixed step size we might go too far in which case we would then reduce the step size and march backwards. So we sort of do it until we get within a tolerance of an object. What's the benefit of this? Well, 
um, we can have participating media. So let's say we have a volume of some media like fog in between. Well, then that ray can pick up information about the fog field that it travels through because it's it's not going directly. It's going one step at a time. So that's a benefit. Or let's say we have a sort of a, a hot region. Well, a hot region has convection currents. I know, really great diagrams, I know. A hot region has convection currents, which could displace that ray a little bit as it sort of um, refracts through the varying air densities. And that could create sort of a, a ripple effect, a heat ripple effect. So there's a benefit there. And the other sort of major benefit is ray tracing is great for we could say objects with like nice uniform depth, but let's say we have a, um, a plane, but this plane does not have a uniform depth. So there could be some various sort of potholes or, or whatever. It could just be a random sort of surface. Well, we would want the ability to sample that depth at any position. And that is a case where a ray marcher could come in common, uh, could come in handy because it shoots along and it hits this at a certain position. And we have the control to say, yep, the depth here is this, the depth here is this, the depth here is this. And this gives us some more complicated geometries. Now, as you can see, this is slow, especially having a fixed step size. So, Another approach is sphere marching. And the way sphere marching works is, uh, let me just generate this and say, okay, there's some sort of, something like this. Okay, and we'll trace a ray through here to hit this point. Okay, so we start here and we sort of, look at a sphere in the region to determine the furthest distance that we can step before we, um, without, without hitting something. Then we go again, and this just sort of continues. Maybe this is a bad example because the spheres are pretty small here. But then hopefully you can see that, um, Maybe that's a bad example, but <laughs> the point is we don't have a fixed step size. The step size is determined by the size of the sphere that we can put at each point. And this can save some computation time because we can reduce the number of steps. And we also reduce the need to sort of step backwards. This doesn't work so well with participating media, but you know, everything is a trade-off in some sense. Okay. so. What are the benefits of ray tracing? Well, for one thing, we can get an almost arbitrary level of detail for simple parameterized shapes. If I look at a sphere, I do not have to define a mesh of a million triangles. I can just give the ray tracer the center, radius, and color, if you will, and I get a pretty nice looking sphere. Um, so for any shape, for any shape, if I can come up with whatever my shape is, who cares? If I can come up with a solution, if I can come up with a solution to A plus direction times T equals B, then I can represent that object without a crazy amount of data, without um, approximating with it with tri triangles. I can do the mathematically true representation of that object. Um, other things, lighting. So lighting is unified with the method. I don't need to make a new shader. I don't need to make a drastically new approach. It's just the same ray tracing stuff reflection, refraction, shadows, it almost kind of comes for free. 
with the ray tracing approach because it's all in the same strategy. So the beautiful simplicity of a unified world, we get this with ray tracing. And the other benefit is if you look at um, current examples of ray tracing versus rasterizing, ray tracing looks about 20% better. The big thing is it has the potential to be a lot better because, and this is just my personal opinion, I feel that a lot of the modern computer games are written with rasterization in mind. But if we can go with a fundamentally different approach of looking at representing models with parametrized shapes instead of triangles, then we can start to make some, I don't know, this is just me speculating, but I think, I think that as real-time ray tracing gets bigger, the fundamental game designs, the fundamental modeling strategies might change. And that could be something really cool and experimental to look into, but it's my own thoughts. Uh, but of course there are drawbacks. So if we go back to this diagram, typical screen would have 1920 pixels by 1080 pixels. Even just a thousand times a thousand is a million. So imagine solving a million equations 60 times per second. And it's not even a million equations because we have to solve the equation a new time for each object. So here it's 3 million twice for these spheres, once more for this light. And then it's not even that because when we, oh, yeah, when we do the light, we're also checking the light against these other objects. So we're saying, hey, this object here, does it block the light? That's another equation we need to solve. So it's like 4 million equations just for this simple case. So it's very slow. Um, the shaders can't make decisions. So the sort of, the traditional sort of optimization of like a conditional statement, if this happens, then render, otherwise don't render, um, that doesn't speed up the shaders. I say this many times, but shader modules, Shader modules, although they are pretty good at handling code, handling matrix multiplication, because they need to sort of sit in a unified sense with each other, they have to work in exactly the same way, which means they cannot be doing conditional statements, making decisions. If I give you an if else statement, a shader will actually evaluate both cases and then select one and go with it, which means that an if else statement does not speed up a shader. So although, although a CPU might not be faster than a shader module at rendering, well, faster than all the shader modules, right? Because it's all of these shader modules versus one CPU. Of course, the shader modules are gonna be faster. The CPU might be more efficient because it can make decisions. So that's a challenge. Um, and then ironically, traditional models like lists of triangles are harder to implement efficiently in ray tracing. Because remember, we're solving a bunch of equations. So every single object in the scene has to be taken into account when the equations are solved, which is a problem. Um, so yeah, that's another challenge to face, but again, I think if we can look into solving arbitrary parametric shapes, or we can look at taking traditional models and breaking them down into groups of parametric shapes, then that will be a big sort of efficiency win in ray tracing. But again, total speculation on my part. So solutions, how do we implement real-time ray tracing? Uh, one option is compute shaders. So a compute shader is um, designed Traditionally, we have vertex shaders and fragment shaders, and they are in the graphics pipeline, so they have a sort of fixed way of operating. But a compute shader is just like a big box, and you throw data into it, and it attempts to parallelize it as much as it can based on its number of shader cores and everything. So 
if you have an insane futuristic graphics card, we could only dream. It would be possibly dedicating a shader core to every single pixel. That's incredibly fast. That doesn't happen, but who knows? Um, so there's that option, there's that option. And then, of course, we do have to write our code in a slightly different way because the traditional optimization stuff doesn't work. Um, and we can't, you know, we can't be too optimal about it. So let's say we have four planes. We have a camera looking at this plane. It would be tempting to say, hey, only send this plane to the shader because that's the only thing we can see. But this plane might be calculating reflections against any of these other planes. And so that full data needs to be sent to the shader. So there's that, it's just another thing to consider. Um, the other solution is sort of a hybrid ray tracing approach. So we could use a rasterizer to get the first sort of trace of the data and then send that data to the uh, ray tracer, sort of using deferred shading and use the ray tracer to do the lighting pass on the deferred shading. And that works. We can get back pretty much all of the performance that we lost in traditional ray tracing with shadows, with lighting. Um, but the downside of that is we can't trace again. So we can't sort of, we can't recover those primary rays. We can't get the arbitrary level of detail on spheres and things. We can approximate them with triangles in our rasterizer. It doesn't look the same. And then the, the third solution is that these next generation graphics APIs, by which I mean Vulkan, DirectX 12, and Metal, have ray tracing pipelines. Which, yeah, that could be a good thing to look into, and I will be looking into that in future. As well as WebGPU is WebGPU is a wrapper for those other APIs. And so in not too much time, I imagine, it will begin to support real-time ray tracing. Imagine that, real-time ray tracing in your browser. It's pretty cool. Anyway, so this has just been a sort of a general introduction to ray tracing. And um, yeah, I hope you found that interesting because I, I love ray tracing. It's a lot of fun. Anyway, all right, all the best. Have a good day, and I'll see you later. Bye.